Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, yep, they did. They got it correct. And uh, we're going to touch on uh, some folks here today out of uh, some writings that I have not brought to you before, but they are about the Constitution, and in particular about oath-breaking. I think that that's uh, important to cover. Also, I just want to mention real quick several different items, and one is a carryover from last week uh, as far as the 14th Amendment being used to uh, raise the debt ceiling. And then we're going to talk about the fallacy of equity or fallacy of equality, and uh, that was prompted actually by a a friend of mine who was on this program uh, several weeks ago is none other than uh, Cody Arnold, who is an up-and-coming professor of uh, political philosophy and so. And I wanted to take something that he presented that I thought was beautiful for today in the whole fallacy of equality and how that was discussed in our recent past, back in the 20th century, if you can remember back that far, uh, my goodness, <sighs> 23 years ago, 24, if you really hit the clock right. But with all of that, we want to continue here and talk about none other than, yes, the recent activities with uh, the Speaker McCarthy and the Joe O'Biden and all that has been happening uh, there in relationship to the debt ceiling. Yep, none other than our Ohio senator, the famous communist Sherrod Brown. Sherrod Brown, yep. He, you know, I always say he's a communist. I, you know, what else do you call people like this except call them leftist, you call them liberal. But what this guy proposes all the time is deceptive evil that is contrary to anything that is God-posed, anything that is foundationally, constitutionally correct. So here it is, 14th Amendment in play. You can see the resource there at samueladamsreturns.net, but old Sherrod Brown, he's out there. I don't reject a Biden bypassing Congress on the debt limit. McCarthy has to pay our bills. No, quite frankly, once again, you go to the article and you listen to all of these socialists and communists that are in the federal bureaucracy and elected, yes, they are, they've had been elected to office, they propose an additional mis- reading interpretation of the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment is the only way that the leftists can get their agenda through. And that's the misinterpretation of it. So I suggest you go back to last week's program, go to the references at samueladamsreturns.net and read, read for yourself. Seek the truth for yourself on the 14th Amendment and how it has been bastardized, perverted, corrupted, and misused by the political left, I'm being kind, and even the political left, socialist, and even communist judiciary. It's a mess total mess. Which brings me to none other than uh, the left in their additional insanities is that of a squad member. Cory Bush is looking for what? $14 trillion for reparation to black Americans. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the Civil War freed black Americans. There's not one slave from the Civil War period still alive. 
nobody else would deserve anything, if anything. And once again, this is the leftist lies and fallacy of not understanding history or how our constitutional republic is supposed to function. So $14 trillion, taxpayer. Hmm. Okay, uh, take a look at that full article there. What, these people are literally off their rockers, and they're getting people out of universities to say it's the right thing to do and justifying it with, once again, rewriting history and introducing deception to confuse the minds of those that are easily confused. Hmm. Wow. That's a lot of the population in America because they've been dumbed down so much. Anyway, lastly, in this uh, grouping of the misuse of constitutionalism, let's go up to Maine. Maine is uh, really one of those weird states. Maine, during the foundation period, it was you know, one of the early states that looked for total liberty. I mean, who would want to live in Maine except for the folks that are hardy? I'm telling you, those that live up on the coast and are the fishermen in particular that are up there, my goodness, that is a hardy Life, And then if you go inland and live up in the cold and the mountains and you get into those other regions there of Maine, you got to be one hardy soul. They used to be for liberty and they wanted to preserve that hardiness and that lifestyle and that liberty, which we're going to talk about when we talk about these other letters uh, kind of anti-federalist, but letters on the Constitution. But here in Maine, you have a Democrat, once again, that is pro-gun control. The Maine state rep is Susan Salisbury, and she says that you have to take and look beyond the Second Amendment and act in the light of real-world experience. What does she mean by that? So if we look in the light of real world experience, we begin to see Russia, communist China, initially Yugoslavia, all of the Russian Marxist communist states. You look at China, look at Cuba, look at Venezuela. Look at all these countries, including now Australia, where they have taken the rights of the people not just to defend themselves, and this is why they want you to look beyond the Second Amendment. There's an article here that I'm posting also from Obama himself, not just O'Biden, but Obama himself talking about the Second Amendment. No, they want to bypass it. They want to look beyond it and point you to real world experiences. And they're talking about all of the evil that is happening in America around firearms. I have a simple cure. I have a simple answer to the gun control issue. It's something I brought up for years for years, very few, if any, have taken me up on it. It's simple. This includes every parochial environment as well. Restore the Ten Commandments into education from kindergarten through postgraduate school. Wait a minute, Tom, you can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. 
In fact, I think there is a couple states out there that I'll put in the references for you that actually are taking and reinstituting the Ten Commandments into education, or maybe just a couple school districts. I don't, I don't recall off the top of my head, but that's there in, in the references. Folks, the Second Amendment wasn't just about personal security. It was, in fact, for the states to be able to call the citizens into action. The standing army is not a, a good thing, as we're seeing the standing army slash police forces have acted in the government's good interest. Well, yes, it was in the government's good interest, but not in the citizens' good interest. So you had things like the FBI knocking on people's doors, taking them into custody. You have the J6 issues. You have, oh, now the IRS agents being armed to the teeth. Uh, you have now paramilitary forces in every federal agency. Well, not every, but a good portion of the federal agencies are having their own police force. Now you have the Capitol Police force that has to send agents, if you will, out into the general populace to protect those that are in Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you that the Second Amendment, as many of you who are listening to this program already know, it is to protect our property, it is to protect our rights. The Second Amendment is there if the government becomes tyrannical. It's also there for that. So that's uh, enough about all of the Second Amendment, so on and so forth, and all of the other insanities that are happening in this first segment, all the way back to the worst insanity is, again, bastardizing the 14th Amendment and what the intentions of the left of the likes ings of Sherrod Brown have intentions to do and to allow for. They support it. Did you do your homework from last week? Did, did you take the time to go and uh, go through the 14th Amendment, Section 4, as well as then all of the founding documents, all the originating documents around the 14th Amendment and what the intention of that was. And now, when I was talking to you last week and teasing you with, I, did, I didn't see it coming, <laughs> honestly. I did not see it coming that none other than this Cory Bush this Democrat from Missouri, and so I didn't believe it when I read it even, is that $14 trillion for reparations. Are they going to use the 14th Amendment for that? Come on. How is that justifiable when you understand those clauses in Section 4, those sentences? This is the stretching the mixing, the hammering, the actions from above, the actions from below, and all of the other movements from the media and everywhere else. They always talk about in the Kozak plan. Yeah, go back, go to the website, samueladamsreturns.net, and uh, put into the search the Kozak plan. There's so much there, so much there. Yep, we are living through that period of time. Well, Sam Adams understood that clearly, and uh, he would it would be reprehensible to him in respect to all of uh, what we see and what's going on in today's time frame. We come back into the next segment. I'm going to talk a little bit about the debates and go into Madison's notes on uh, the Constitution, talking specifically about Mr. Sherman. And in including Mr. Sherman, we're going to talk a little bit about a letter that William Williams wrote uh, in reference to oaths. And what does that mean? And we'll talk about that. And I have a link also to uh, what um, we have from my 
friend General Vallely and what he wrote. So come on back in the next segment when Sam Adams returns. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second segment of Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they did. They got it. They got it more than most people get it. And as I always say, is that's why Obama was up there in Chicago, because he went to the University of Chicago, where there is a large collection, the largest collection of the anti-federalist writings there at the University of Chicago. And he and as many of the other uh, communists that were up there, that that's why they were there, is to learn how do you take apart the U.S. Constitution. Well, you utilize everything that the anti-federalists pointed out that would be the demise, the destruction of the nation. It just makes sense, doesn't it? Ah, think about it for a while. Maybe uh, read the Anti-Federalist Papers and see then also, in conjunction with the COSAC plan, how this manipulation of everything that has been occurring has the underlying tidbits of an educated, evil group of people. So to that respect, what I wanted to bring to your attention is about oath breakers. Now, an oath is supposed to be something that is a very uh, solemn, meaningful, and uh, it has consequences when it's broken. When you take and make an oath, you are taking and engaging in a covenant with those you are taking that oath with. So as I was taking and looking at um, what that means, we have to take and understand the founder's definition of a covenant. So let me put that into my Webster dictionary in real time. And what do we get? A covenant. Covenant is that a mutual consent or agreement of two or more persons to do or forbear some act or thing, a contract, a stipulation. So here again it says it's a writing containing the terms of agreement or contract between the parties. In theology, the covenant of works is that implied in the commands, prohibitions, and promises of God, the promises of God to man, that man's a perfect obedience should entitle him to happiness. And we go on to look at covenant as a verb, is to enter into a formal agreement to stipulate, to bind oneself by a contract. So that's the basics of it. Now, where I want to talk about is something in oath, and, and let's start with the uh, concept here of something that General Vallely wrote, and I wanted to bring it to your attention. He wrote it back on May 7th, and when he was talking about all of those that um, anyone who takes an oath, he took an oath a number of times, I've taken the oath a number of times to protect this country, the oath of service. So every elected person, every bureaucrat, every district attorney, mayors, governors, you name it. Even when I was on the mental health board in my county, I had to take an oath to the constitutions of Ohio and the United States. Now, there is federal law for oath breakers. So the article here that he has is violation of oath and criminal negligence. And in that is the violation of an oath of office means the neglect or knowingly what? knowingly to uh, fail in that office or to perform it faithfully or in faith. And it's entirely a duty imposed by law. And uh, there is violation for that. That violation of office means the neglect knowingly to do so. It's in the U.S. Code, uh, in a number of different places in the U.S. Code. And for violating it, violation of the oath of office is a, a serious offense. 
So what is going on? Where is it? First off, in the code. The, the notes and the link to this letter is there, and it is in federal law, and uh, it is for any officer that is uh, there, not just uh, any office and officer, so any elected official, any bureaucrat that is required to take the oath. And this is in 18 U.S.C. 1918. And it provides the penalties for violating it, uh, and it's in 5 U.S.C. 7311. And it includes the removal of office and confinement or a fine. So the definition there of advocate, which it talks about, is further specified in Executive Order 10450, which for enforcement supplements what I mentioned already in 5 U.S.C. 7311. So a violation of oath is a felony, a felony. And um, wow, 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 wow. When we look at that, we have nobody out there that is willing to enforce a violation of oath. Well, first off, let me characterize it for you a little bit in that most people don't even know what a violation of oath is because they think that people that are there are doing their jobs. And then when they complain that a person isn't doing their job, but if you don't know what the job description is, how do you know that they're violating their job? You can take and whine and cry and moan and all of that all you want to, but uh, unless you understand those details of what a job entitles, uh, it's kind of hard to say, well, they're not doing it. They're not doing it in good faith. Well, let's just put it this way. Anyone who has a, a leftist ideology from a very simple socialist to the entrenched communist are in violation of their oath. But we have to believe in someone greater than yourself. You can't consider yourself or the government to be your God because then there's no accountability there. So that goes to what I've talked about in the past. So I'll let you go and look at General Vallely's uh, article there, but I want to really shake up your minds a little bit, if they aren't already, with a letter from William Williams, which was printed February 11th, 1788. And in this, he is talking about uh, the newspaper article that in, in re re relationship to the federal constitution and the convention in the state that he was in, and this was the American Mercury is where the article was written. And in there, there was someone who was talking about uh, the election, specifically the election of the House of Representatives. And where he is looking at in the uh, clause in the sixth article, talking about no religious test should ever be required as a qualification to any office or trust, which references to the oath, because that would be any officer, any uh, person in the bureaucracy, as well as anyone that's elected. So anyone that raises their hand and takes the oath that there should be no religious test should be required a, a, as a qualification, and that came under consideration. And when he was in the state convention and he was observing through all of this, it wasn't the idea of a religious test that uh, it should be totally um, uh, eliminated. He didn't think that that was the right thing to do, but uh, that there should have been better language used and inserted into the federal constitution that explicitly acknowledged the being of God and the God of the Christian Bible the New and Old Testament, so the Judeo-Christian God. And there's a reason for this that he'll get into. First off, you can be an oath-breaker because you don't believe in God. So 
that is something that is you know very important to understand. So he brings it into context and in saying that in the Constitution, uh, it should be something like this. We, and this is in from the preamble perspective, as well as there in uh, the Article 6, is that we, the people of the United States, in a firm belief of the being and perfections of the one, one living and true God, the creator and supreme governor of the world, in his universal providence and authority of his laws, that we will require all of all moral agents an account of their conduct, that all rightful powers among men are ordained of and immediately derived from God. Therefore, in a dependence on his a blessing and acknowledgement of his efficient protection in establishing our independence, whereby it is become necessary to agree upon and settle a constitution of federal government for ourselves, and then it goes into, and in order to form a perfect union, as it then is expressed further in the preamble to the Constitution. His proposal obviously was rejected, and, and he wasn't trying to take and describing that speak specifically to any particular denomination of the Christian sort. That's not what he was talking about. What he was talking about is that we have to have something there that establishes the foundational fundamentals of belief such that you cannot ignore your oath. Because when you take your oath, now something can be tested. How is it then do you know that someone is violating their oath? Are, are, are they even worthy to go into office, to hold that place? Will they operate from what I've talked about in the past and from other authors very clearly? Will they serve the public with a clear understanding that God is sovereign, the God of the Bible, the God of Christianity, and even Judaism is more sovereign than any human being or the state. Will they serve that God? Will they function in law? Will they function in interpretation of the constitutions? Will they function, I say that, constitutions of the states as well as the federal, will they function in adjudicating? Will they function in carrying out their executive charges in the three branches of government? That's what he's talking about. Where is that? Where is it that you can look at what it means to take and build that up. And what we're seeing, and he saw at that time, was even in Europe and in England, that a straw man can be knocked over again and again. And that is when language, for you that are on the radio or the podcast, I'm coming from my mouth and expressing with my fingers is the language. People can spew anything they want. That's why we have so much lying and deceit in political campaigns. They can say whatever they want, but they don't act according to what they say. So what Mr. Williams was saying, that he you know, acknowledges that this test would, should be done. And, and you can look at the whole idea of the hypocrisy that people would call around it, but what is it for duty? What is it for oath? Then he finishes off with this. I thought it was my duty to make the observations in this behalf, which I did, and to bear my testimony for God, and that it was also my duty to say the Constitution with this and some other faults of another kind was yet too wise and too necessary to reject. So he wasn't rejecting the Constitution. He thought that that clause... And that requirement should have been there. But the fact of the matter is, is that 
We have to hold people accountable. There's no one that's doing it. Justice Department doesn't do it. Local people don't do it. And most elected people don't know how to do it because they don't vet candidates. So come on back for the third segment as we finish up with Sam Adams, and he's returning. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this last segment of Sam Adams Returns, those anti-federalists. Yeah, they got it right. This is Tom Novolish, your host. And once again, for all of you that uh, only get the first and third segment, I highly recommend you go listen to the full podcast or watch video where I delve into the interesting discussion around oath. What does it mean to take an oath? And um, I think you'll find it very interesting. And with that, I wanted to now go to what I opened the program with is a, a quote from, that I saw that uh, Cody Arnold put up, and it just struck me as something that was important, not only from past programs, but also uh, relative to everything we're talking about today. And in particular, what I've talked about in the past, that's the new um, contentious terminology going from uh, the Christian nationalism to now uh, Christian dumb 2.0. And I don't mean dumb Christians, which there's a lot of those out there because they don't understand the rounded view and truth of the scriptures. But this comes from a gentleman by the name of Wilmore Kendall. And he, uh, I'll give you a little bit more information about him. He's not someone that a lot of people outside of maybe academia uh, recall because he was an early 20th century uh, educator, philosopher, pretty, pretty savvy guy. And let's get to the quote. Anyway, this was uh, Kendall on Christianity, virtue, and the foundation of America. Believe it or not, in a short order of time, I downloaded a, a number of his uh, elements to read, and boy, oh boy, the guy's deeper than what uh, I ever ran into. I mean, I myself, I neglected to find out anything about this man. So thank you, Cody. I appreciate uh, you taking and pointing him out to me. So here's the quote. What is to keep the virtuous people virtuous? The question is an old as Greek philosophy and Greek philosophy offered, on one level at least, the decisive answer. People will be virtuous only to the extent that the souls of its individual components are rightly ordered. And the right ordering of souls is the business of education. That would call, in the language of the Massachusetts body of liberties, for education capable of ordering individual souls in accordance with the principles of humanity, civility, and Christianity. An education appropriate to the maintenance of the virtue of the people cries up at us a further problem that wants critical clarification. When the public orthodoxy is guaranteed by transcendence, by the word of God, then the truth of the soul and of society— the first principles of the politity and of metaphysics, that is, the very being of both, are theoretically guaranteed. Beyond this guarantee, which can be had only as a gift and as a blessing, there is no other for any human society born upon this earth. And that was Wilmore Kendall. Uh, from the basic symbols of the American political tradition and also a portion from Cicero and the politics of public orthodoxy. We, we talk about often that 
um, John Adams and Madison said that the Constitution is only for what? A virtuous and moral or slash religious people. I think that uh, what Kendall does here is he takes and he really digs into what is virtue because we have so many definitions of virtue and when we even go and we look at Webster's Dictionary, how he zeroes through what is virtue, what is public virtue, what is private virtue, and trying to bring that into a definition of a societal virtue versus that of a Christian virtue or in compatible form to Christian virtue. Kindle wraps that up in education. This is what Sam Adams talked about. When he talked about education, he was writing to John Adams. He wrote to a number of those that he was always in contact with, and he even stated it as lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, the importance of education but in that, as we have here from Kendall, he ties in the principles of humanity, civility, and Christianity. If you don't have that fundamentals of understanding where we fit as humans in that sovereign order, and then for society is the soul, the truths of the soul, which are guaranteed by the word of God, I, you miss it. You cannot have a civil society. So that goes back to what I talked about, what, in the earlier portion of the program. I think I brought it out both in the first and a tad in the second segment, is that the whole issue of gun control is simple to fix. Much of what we have going on in the evils that we see, we call them evil because they're related to our sinful natures. Easy to fix, called beginning with the Ten Commandments. You begin with the Ten Commandments, now you're talking about how to reach to a man's soul. And I've talked about what importance that is from not just our present, but also from an eternal basis. It means a lot in how we govern. What is the soul of this nation but not made up of individuals and individual souls? We talked about that with William Williams in the second segment. And what did that mean when it comes to taking and qualifying people to even be in office. What is a religious test? It's not what denomination someone is a part of. It's where is their soul in relationship to the biblical God? Can they carry out their duty in office, understanding that there is a sovereign of the universe that then takes and brings virtue into the people in general. So what is that? What does it keep? You know, what is to keep virtuous people virtuous? Or we say it begins at the pulpits, that's for sure. And that's where we have to have a society that clearly understands that. So as we take and we uh, go through more of what all this means, we have to take a look then at uh, a little bit of, let's see, where did I put him? More of what Kendall has to say on his website. So let me tell you a little bit about Kendall. He has a website there that the link is uh, there at samueladamsreturns.net. So Kendall was an individual. He took and uh, he was around quite the author. Uh, he was a political scientist, student of American political tradition, and defender of majority rule. He uh, was born in 1909, and uh, quite honestly, he did a lot of work through the 30s and even into uh, 1961, where after over a decade of grief, fighting with liberal orthodoxy at Yale, he offered them 
the uh, let Yale buy out his tenure. So he was a professor there at Yale, and he got sick and tired of all the leftists there. And uh, he said, "Buy me out, buy me out of my. You know, I'll get out of here. You guys can, you know, go hell bent if you want to. That's my word." Uh, then he took and he went in and allowed him to start a political program modeled after his own experience at Oxford at the newly formed Catholic University, the University of Dallas. And that's where he spent the rest of his life, and he died of a heart attack in 1968. Um, he was also known for his participation in the founding of National Review with William F. Buckley. Interesting. So I guess that's where I, I read some National Review, but I'll be honest with you, I wasn't as familiar with Kendall as with Buckley. But one of the areas that he really covered in here, and this goes back to what I started out in the first segment on uh, with the you know leftists and wanting $14 trillion for reparation and all of that, uh, Kendall really got into the question of what is... Um, the the idea of here in America, our concepts, our truth of taking and looking at equality and understanding equality from the founders' perspective, especially when it came in through the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the current understanding that he talks about is that of equality that all of the pundits and the commentators and all of that, what they're talking about is that Marxist concept of it. They, they look at it from that radical view uh, of equality and saying that, uh, you know what, equality is a condition uh, and it's all that uh, that is contrary to the founders. He said it's contrary. So we have to take this into consideration that, once again, there's people like him that established some significant truths, and that what we have to look at is the true orthodoxy of what does it mean for even virtue, and how do we maintain that? And if we're not maintaining it in the concept that is biblically justified, that comes from our understanding of a living God, you're not going to get there, folks. And that goes for all of us that are politically involved. I talked about that, and I've been talking about it for a while. Who's your God? Where do you put your concept of sovereignty? How do you live within that truth? So are you taking and... Um, as he talks about here, are you giving aid and comfort to the enemy? Uh, Kendall advocates that the restraint in glorifying the word equality is uh, giving in to the enemy, and that from a conservative uh, disposition, you have to go back again to the founder's idea. Um, it's quite interesting and how that all comes together. So let me wrap this up for you a little bit today. And what you really, I would recommend, suggest that you do, go back to last week, review what was written there in, in the references. A lot of material, obviously, that needs to be covered. There's a couple references here this week with Kendall and the other articles that I brought forth. But mostly it comes down to uh, how do you understand the mechanisms of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution at a federal level, as well as your state? Do you know your state constitution? Many people haven't even cracked it open don't even know their Bill of Rights. I was on that project for a while, and maybe we need to get back to it. That's what you need to do. You need to understand those truths, and you need to understand them in the context of biblical truth. Sam Adams did. He talked about that all the time. That's where I looked at and was trying to bring you, and we'll continue to work on bringing you the idea of 
that uh, political psychology, because remember, psychology is the study of the soul of man. So if you're going to have virtue in summarizing, you need to understand your soul and its relationship, and you need to understand the soul of the nation by virtue of how it is all tied together in your own soul. Sam Adams did. The Anti-Federalists did. Come on back next week.